So what is, where, where, where are we now? Where are we now? Um, we are, what we are witnessing is a, uh, the, the, the increasing executive control over the judiciary and the legislative. If you look at just um, from a constitutional point of view, um, all major decisions in Turkey are being made by, um, uh, uh, by Erdogan and by his uh, courtiers. Um, some of you may know uh, he uh, built a, a new court in uh, Ankara, in Beştepe. Um, he uh, moved uh, the residence of the presidency from Çankaya, which was the seat of the presidency uh, uh, since uh, Mustafa Kemal. Uh, so he moved into a new place, um, um, which was actually, which is actually um, uh, um, the um, uh, farm of Mustafa Kemal. So he, he built a new palace on the older, former. Uh, uh, um, farm of, of Mustafa Kemal, um, and all major decisions about anything, um, urban policy, foreign policy, economic policy, social policy, is being taken by um, Erdogan and, and his uh, courtiers. So we are moving towards a one-man regime, a dictatorship. So the first question um, that comes to mind is if you if you follow Turkish politics for the last decade, um, this party and this politician have been singled out as the democratic force in Turkey, right? So um, the, that was the AKP. The AKP was um, um, the new democratic force in Turkey, according to Western media and a lot a lot of the analysts. Um, this was the new model for the rest of the Middle East. I mean, if you remember, um, with uh, the Arab uprisings and so on, um, Turkey was um, shown as the um, sort of showcase of liberal democracy and how liberal democracy can work in a Muslim state. Right? So how you can combine Islam and democracy. So here we have, uh, a, you know, Islamists, who are at the same time Democrats, like the Christian Democrats in Germany, or, or um, uh, like the Republicans in the US, they have strong religious convictions, but they are Democrats, democratic people nevertheless. They believe in the principles of, of liberal democracy. So it turns out that this is not the case anymore. So this uh, um, conviction is emp empirically uh, um, proven to be wrong. So what went wrong is the question. Um, if you read the Western media and uh, most of the mainstream Turkish media, uh, less and less so because the Turkish media is now controlled also by, uh, uh, by Erdogan, by the court, um, they put the blame on Erdogan himself. So there's something wrong with this guy, he is too ambitious. He is. Uh, uh, he wants more and more power. Um, he is sort of um, caught up in this drive for or for power, and he's, he's driving the country, the party, the whole regime into a catastrophe with himself. That is the. Um, that is this discourse. But what what is the function of this discourse? Is that Basically saying that there is nothing wrong with the model. There is nothing wrong with uh, our model of liberal democracy. Um, the liberal democratic model can be uh, transposed into the Middle East, into Asia, into Africa. It's a universal model. There is nothing wrong with it. It can work anywhere. So instead of um, criticizing the model, instead of um, sort of looking at the model and seeing, well, what was wrong with the model, you put the blame on this one guy who messed up the whole thing, and you kind of get away with the model itself. Um, when Erdogan first built his court, um, I think that was two years ago, right? 
um, I, I, I wrote a piece um, based on uh, this German sociologist's uh, uh, work, Norbert Elias, on court society, in which he claims, well, whenever you see a one-man regime, a court society, that means there is a lot of conflict within the elites, and that these elites, without this one man, cannot actually agree on certain rules, on certain norms, uh, to regulate the competition uh, among themselves. Um, so I think that also applies to uh, the Erdogan regime. Um, increasingly, the collegial decision-making mechanism cannot work for, for the AKP and for its rent distributing mechanism. Increasingly, all rents have to be distri distributed by just one person because other than, uh, uh, if that is not the case, you cannot contain the struggle among these elites. There is a lot of struggle because there is a lot of rent to be distributed well, actually, there's a lot of clients who are claiming uh, uh, rents, and there's increasingly uh, um, less and less rent to be distributed. But there's also promise of larger rents, and that applies especially to uh, foreign policy. There's a promise of a bigger Turkey, of more influential, more powerful Turkey, that if you hold on till the bitter end, then we're going to get some uh, 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 goodies at the end, you know, some booty. Um, so, but what, what, so what, what does Erdogan represent? Um, I won't go into details, but what was uh, the main driving force behind uh, AKP was, according to me, two things. One was the um, urbanization process which have been taking place for the last 20, 30 years, right? Especially uh, since late 70s, uh, if I may say. Um, the, um, if you look at the ideological origins of this party, it's an Islamist party, uh, which was based on uh, Anatolian small, uh, medium uh, capitalists, right? But there was a transformation, a big social transformation, in the late 70s and, and, and 80s. Okay. Um, and that was um, basically an urbanization process. Um, a, 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 we, tra we were transformed, I mean, as a Turkish as, 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 as Turkey society, uh, we became increasingly an urban society. Uh, back in the 70s, most of the population was living in, uh, in the villages, uh, in provincial areas. Now, most of the society is living in urban areas, right? Um, and with the coup in 1980, um, the uh, Turkish government switched from an import substituting uh, uh, developmental model to a export-oriented developmental model, um, with a lot of funding uh, being pumped into uh, small and medium uh, entrepreneurs, and that created a new rising uh, uh, bourgeoisie. Um, at the same time, a huge new urban uh, uh, proletarian class. So this um, movement, the AKP, uh, if you look at it, in terms of in, in terms of social analysis, is an alliance between these two groups of of, of uh, these, these two social groups, right? And this is its success, but I think it will also be its ultimate failure. You know, so how can you? Uh, because the if you look at the uh, interests of these two social groups, they are obviously conflicting. You know, one is urban poor, the other one is is making money out of these poor people. So, but its success was to keep these two groups together. And religious identity, uh, in this sense, or, or Islamist identity, was a protest identity that served the cultural interests of both of these groups against the established urban uh, uh, classes. So it, this ideology forged this alliance 
or legitimize this alliance against the insiders. So they both these uh, because both these classes identified as outsiders to the establishment, especially to the Kemalist um, establishment. But what we're seeing increasingly is that the um, uh, we saw it at the, uh, um, at the Soma incident when, uh, um, in, uh, in, in Soma, uh, when uh, 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 you know, uh, dozens of, of, of miners died because of an accident. We saw it in the latest uh, strikes last year, uh, especially in the metal sector. Um, so there is a lot of uh, um, grumbling on the ground especially from workers uh, 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 that the AKP is not attending to their to their needs to their interests and so on and so forth and this is a time when um, uh, the AKP regime is uh, becoming more and more uh, authoritarian so coming back to um, the uh, liberal conservative uh, thesis about about AKP um, when we were discussing uh, the AKP regime uh, five, six years ago in academic circles, um, one of the most fashionable explanation was, well, AKP is a protest against the state, right? Uh, this is the liberal conservative thesis. Um, it goes back um, to... Um, uh, to the um, um, political thesis of uh, uh, the political right uh, in uh, 1960, 1961, after the first uh, coup in Turkey. It claims that Turkish society is different from all other societies. We are a unique society. Um, you have class conflicts in European societies. In Turkey, there has always been a strong state. Um, um, it goes back to uh, the Byzantium uh, Empire. Uh, there's always been a strong state. It's Caesar Papism. You know, you have a, a, a strong bureaucracy versus the people. So we don't have class conflict. Political conflict in Turkey consists of the contradiction between the state and the people. Um, and this has become very influential also among leftist circles after the second coup in 1972, when they were dismayed, well, there was an expectation on part of, um, um, I would say, the mainstream left that uh, at least some of the uh, um, military officers might be uh, um, uh, leftists, that there might be a leftist coup, as it happened in 1960, that was their thinking. So. When it turned out that that was not the case and they found themselves in jail, they started thinking about it and they said, well, maybe uh, the right was right after all. Maybe there is, uh, you know, in Turkey we don't have class conflict, we don't have workers versus the capitalists. Um, maybe the main contradiction is between the people and the bureaucracy. And this old thesis became very fashionable in uh, 2010 uh, when uh, the AKP proposed a referendum, um, which um, at that time I thought it was basically uh, AKP's grip for more power, um, and specifically it was a grip over uh, the judiciary. Um, so this um, liberal conservative thesis, um, which is based on a very sort of, it, it conceives of the state as not a social relation, but as just a bureaucratic apparatus. Right? So there's a bureaucratic apparatus and there's, there are the people. So what should the left do is um, uh, support uh, the AKP's uh, struggle against the bureaucracy, against the military, against the judiciary, right? But what was really happening was that the AKP was actually getting control over the bureaucratic apparatus. Um, and because of the lack of class analysis, I think a lot of uh, uh, the leftists missed uh, 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 that point. Um, 
And now what we're witnessing, after, after 2010 referendum, uh, we witnessed all these cases against the old uh, uh, deep, what we call the deep states, right? The, um, um, uh, the military uh, um, apparatchiks, the intelligence uh, apparatchiks, they were put into jail because they were uh, uh, conspiring against uh, uh, the AKP government. They were staging a coup. That was the charge, right? Um, and all of a sudden, all these uh, um, charges were dropped. All the um, um, supposedly members of this uh, conspiracy were uh, uh, let go uh, out of the prison. And we have now a new alliance between the former deep states, the, uh, the old military uh, 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 um, people, and, and AKP. Um, and what, what is the agenda? The agenda is basically the war against the Kurds. Uh, what they call, they call it the Vatan Savunması, so the defense of the fatherland, right? And um, a... Um, a, 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 a proxy war in Syria and Iraq. So basically, um, um, a, either a, a, an expansion of, of Turkish borders or um, a, some kind of an Iranian expansion of influence. You know, at least let's get our own Hezbollah in, in Syria or Iraq. If we can't get any territory, let's get some people who can work for us. That's the, um, that's the agenda. And um, the main ideologue of this agenda is uh, the current Prime Minister Ahmed Davutoglu, uh, who served both um, as uh, the Foreign Minister and as an advisor uh, to the Prime Minister and to the President, and who's been a, a former academic uh, of foreign policy of international politics. Um, I, he has this book called um, uh, Strategic Death in which he compares himself to Mackinder. So that's the uh, Turkish grand strategy. Um, the main idea is based on the assumption that uh, the Kemalists were passive. They were not proactive. They turned their back to the Middle East because they were westernizers. They were alienated from the people. They didn't uh, share, they did, they, did, they did not have any confidence in the people's values, in the people's uh, um, um, you know, religious uh, uh, beliefs. Um, so they were very <laughs> passive. Uh, that's why Turkey um, didn't become a big country. Uh, now, um, since uh, we, uh, by we I mean the AKP, is uh, depending on the people's values, Turkey can become a big country again. Um, now, and a lot of people bought this idea, including uh, um, you know um, Western academics. They thought, well, this is a new way, a fresh way of thinking about Turkey. Turkey can gain influence. And it was a very instrumental thing because the Westerners thought, oh, now uh, Turkey become a insider uh, propagandist publicist for our own values. Um, but Davutoglu, if you look really carefully about what Davutoglu is saying, he's basically suggesting that um, in order not to have any internal conflicts, we have to carry the conflict outside. So basically, and with internal conflict, of course, he means the Kurdish issue. If you don't want to have uh, the Kurdish issue, we will have to take this fight to abroad. And by abroad, of course, you mean you know Iraq or or or, or Syria. So, and that is his his uh, uh, main security uh, concept. Well, of course, there are some important things that are wrong about this. Um, um, about this doctrine. Well, first of all, historically speaking, uh, the Kemalists, they turned their back to the Middle East, not because of any values or ideology or anything, because they lost the war. 
I mean, they fought the war, they lost it, so they had to retrench, right? And at that time, when they retrenched, uh, uh, the neighbors uh, was not Iraq and Syria, but it was France and, and Great Britain. So there was not much choice than to retrench. Secondly, when they had the opportunity to expand, they did, such as the annexation of uh, the Republic of Hatay. So when they had the chance to gain more territory in that region, they did it. Um, so it wasn't a question of values. Um, but the, this rhetoric of, well, if we um, go back to our values, if we go back to our Middle Eastern roots, uh, then we can make peace with uh, the Middle Eastern people. Um, we, um, that was called, back then, it was called the zero problem policy, right? Um, uh, let's have no visas with Syria, you know, let's have, you know, that was the time when they were best buddies with, with Bashar Assad, right? I mean, Bashar Assad and the Erdogan family would go to Bodrum for holidays and so on and so forth. So they were really in good terms. And that, the, the, the reasoning, however, was very flawed because it was basically an idealist sort of doctrine uh, claiming that you know, if you go back to our original values, whatever that is, then uh, Turkey is going to become a big... Uh, country again. Um, that was, of course, very appetizing for the Turkish bourgeoisie as a whole, not just for the new rising uh, bourgeoisie. I call them the new Victorians, not just for the Victorians, but also for the established Turkish bourgeoisie. It was very appetizing because it brings you money. Um, but what was um, problematic at that time was that this um, new strategic initiative was based on the assumption that Turkey was going to solve its own Kurdish problem. It is no coincidence that both AKP's policy towards the Kurds and uh, towards the Middle East is both called Açılım, strategic opening. Um, so um, they, they initiated this peace process with the PKK, um, and based on that peace process, they were hoping they were going to get hold of uh, the Kurds or they were going to make allies of Kurds in Iraq and in Syria, right? Um, and, um, if I, and again, if you look at their main thesis, their main thesis with the Kurdish uh, issue is, well, well, you're Kurdish, I'm Turkish, but we are both Muslims at at, at the end of the day, right? I mean, that, that's their, their solution. We're both Sunni, okay? So that's why if you, if, if, if you look at how um, the AKP is trying to marginalize the PKK within the Kurdish population is blaming them either with being Armenians, okay? Well, well that's one thing. Uh, they are actually of Armenian origin, you know? Yeah, and which is a very bad thing to be in, in Turkey. Um, and or uh, blaming them with being Zaraustrian, uh, they they are actually Zaraustrians, or or blaming them with being Alawites, okay, with followers of Ali. So this is the main uh, um, st uh, strategy of 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 the AKP towards the Kurds, um, and um, it it turns out that it it does not work out as well. Uh, it, by the way, this is nothing new. Um, this has been suggested before. I mean, if you look at it historically, the first move of the Turkish state towards the Kurds was to deny the existence of the Kurds. You know, these are mountain Turks. They are calling them Kurds because when you uh, walk on snow in the mountains, you make the nose kart, kurt, kart, kurt, so they are called Kurds. That was the explanation. That was actually a thesis, if you believe it or not. I mean, I can find you books published uh, like that. Um, when that didn't work out, so when uh, there was no uh, ethnic assimilation of the Kurds possible or ethnic cleansing, that was also uh, tried. I mean, the uh, villages were emptied. Uh, a lot of the Kurdish villages were pushed into the cities. Uh, they became a uh, cheap labor force. But still, 
uh, uh, this you know, Kurdish identity could not be wiped out. Uh, then the next step was, well, we are all uh, Muslims, and now um, I think we are also coming to an end of this model. So I, I don't know, it turns out that um, now we're running out of any kind of assimilating uh, models. We'll see what's, what's coming uh, next. But what is really important is that strategy is tied to a foreign policy initiative in the Middle East which is very reminiscent of what Indira Gandhi was trying to do in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, right? So uh, basically starting this uh, strategic initiative towards the Tamils and then using Tamils as a leverage for influence in Sri Lanka. That was uh, um, uh, uh, Gandhi's strategy with at the end fired back. And I think this is also something that the AKP is going to go uh, through. Um, before I um, end with my um, presentation, um, a lot of the uh, Western attention on AKP is now on AKP's foreign policy because they're messing things up in Syria, they're messing things up in Iraq, for, especially for, uh, for the US because Turkey is acting with Israel and with Saudi Arabia against this US <laughs> rapprochement with, with Iran. So it's kind of this anti-Iranian alliance that is acting independently or trying to act independently from the US. So it is messing things up for the US. It is making life uh, harder for the US in the Middle East. So, um, but what is this about? Is not just personal ambitions of Erdogan, uh, geostrategy, in this sense, is at the same time state formation. <clears throat> Pretty much uh, uh, like the process you see in Russia, for example, uh, Russian foreign policy is at the same time Russian state formation, right? A new uh, um, 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 regime, a, a new uh, 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 balance of, of uh, political and social forces, uh, which is uh, uh, consolidated or which is enabled through an uh, aggressive uh, militaristic uh, foreign policy and strategic uh, thinking. So um, a lot of both, um, you know, there's a dialectics between them. Um, if uh, Turkish foreign policy fails, then it's gonna have very important effects domestically. If uh, uh, Erdogan's domestic policies fail, and there can be various ways in which it can fail. We can, we can talk about this in the Q&A session. Then it is going to have a very important effect on uh, foreign policy and Middle Eastern policy. And this is where I want to stop and uh, talk.